Well, you mentioned Steve Bird, and you start out the 1991 season like you're shot out of a cannon. Uh, 100%. Uh, tenth, <laughs> you were 10th at Daytona, 3rd yeah. at Richmond, 2nd at Rock, Rockingham, 3rd at Martinsville, and then finally you got that first win at Volusia yep. County. Thank God. W- was Steve the difference? Oh, yeah, 100%. Birdie, Birdie is from the Northeast, and we all know people from New York, New Jersey. We know that they're just a different breed. <laughs> they will cuss you out right now, and they don't mean nothing by it. They just cussing you because you're in their way or you're aggravating them. Birdie, Steve Bird was an authoritative figure. Every there, there was no question in Birdie. If Birdie said, go get me a 916 wrench, everybody on our team just went and got it. You know, (laughs) nobody was like, well, why, Birdie? Because Birdie had already done one a lot with Steve Grissom. So we, you know, we were lucky to get Birdie. I mean, we didn't even try. He quit them. And we immediately called him. And uh, I remember Steve Grissom's dad saying, uh, you're going to like going to victory lane. Birdie was hardcore. And I was a mediator in 91. I had to keep the team and Birdie from fighting. (laughs) That was my job. (laughs) You know what I mean? But, Come on, but, man. We got to have something to write about. Oh, but Bert, <laughs> Birdie, Birdie, listen, I love Birdie. And actually, I'll see him here in Florida in a little bit. Uh, it, it's sad in life that we got to go through all these life lessons. But now that I'm older, I look back and I realized he was just your typical leader. You know, you know nowadays, everybody's so darn soft. At, you know, say please. You know, back then, we never said please. We don't get time to say please. Let's, you know. We always went to the racetrack. It was war. When you came through that pit gate, it was war. You know, we we ain't got time to worry about feelings. And and I got to tell you, although it was you know it was rough back then, but we didn't know it was rough. It was just we just argued all the time. It's just what we did. We argued, but we you know it was like a, and then and then when we you know when they shut the garage area down. We'd all get back to the hotel. We was all happy. <laughs> it was like, whoo, that was a tough day, you know. Hey, remember when I MF'd you? That, yeah, that was during practice, man. Don't, don't worry about it, you know what I mean? We got that thing running better, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was good stuff. What do you remember about that day at Volusia County, your first win? I remember everything. Specifically, remember, well, I'll, I'll remember two days. I remember the day before I qualified 13th, and Birdie was so disappointed in me, and I was crushed. But just got, you know, slept, got up next morning, and uh, they dropped the green flag in my car. And, and that's what Birdie was good at. I told Birdie, I said, Birdie, I'm pushing. You know, and, and I tried my very best, you know, because you know, remember, I was a crew chief years before. So I, you know, I was, I'm like, Birdie, I get in the corner, I can turn down in, but right here my front end's taking off and birdie heard me so he come in you know to volusia and uh i don't know the adjustments he made because i was taught once i got a crew chief you know you tell him what the car is doing and that was weird for me that was weird for me to just tell a crew chief yeah. i was like so i just tell the crew chief what the car's doing and he and he fixes it you know <laughs> and he fixed it and they dropped the green flag rick in that race and I passed everybody on the outside, and I and I was like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is unbelievable!" So, uh, won that race, and I specifically remember in Victor Lane hugging my wife and going, "Finally!" And later on, maybe it was you, I don't know, or you, and you said, "What did you?" Somebody said, "What did you?" One of the media members said, "What What did you mean when you said finally?" And I looked at him. I said, "You heard it," because I felt like I whispered it to my wife. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to be able to win ever. And when I won, it was like, oh, my God, I won. This is unbelievable. <laughs> so, and you, and you won against Bobby Labonte, yeah. won against, you know, Chuck Barrett, won, won against, you know, the, these great, you know, Tommy Houston and, you know, I beat the best that were my heroes. Outrun them. I outrun them, and that, that was big. You and I talked for second to none, the Bush Series book, and you told me a great story about Rusty meeting you at the airport. Yes. Good good memory. Did he ever give you your trophy back? Yes. I think it was once. Now, he actually, tell tell the story. I, I went and, yeah, 
so uh, you got to remember now at that time, you know, NASCAR is kind of becoming like uh, really big. Money's starting to flow. Sponsors are calling you, wanting to sponsor you. You, you. Back then, you guys know this as good as I do, you didn't really have to hunt for sponsors. So, you know, Rusty's kicking butt. He's a hero in NASCAR. So now he can afford an airplane. He sends this airplane, his airplane, just a nice twin engine prop. Back then there was no jets whatsoever. And uh, we get on the airplane with the trophy. And uh, <laughs> we we fly from, uh, you know, Daytona. You know, that's Volusia. We fly to the Charlotte Douglas Airport, which was nowhere near as big as it is now. And we landed on the back runway. When we land, we kind of puttered up there. And I and I opened the door, you know, and I stuck that trophy out. And Rusty said, give me that damn trophy. That's mine. You're not getting it back. I'm like, no, <laughs> kid, no. no I was like, that's the only thing I got, you know. He would not give me that trophy back so much to where I was over at his house or shop. And I, I tipped the trophy over and I found the trophy maker and I called him up and I said, can you make me? Cause, <laughs> cause at that time they were building all the Bush series trophies. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, well, and I kind of like this. I kind of like trophies back in the day in the Bush series because, you know, let's just say there was 30 races. Let's just, you know, I think there's probably 20 something, but let's say 30, all 30 trophies were the same. And it, it were they really? It, well, you you would get two trophies back then. So you know there was yeah. a there was a time where things changed, but they were the same. Okay, like even if you won the the Winston Cup championship, that that trophy was always the same. Remember the big wooden trophy? So I'll show you uh, pictures of my race shop right now. Even the Bush Series in the late nineties, they were all identical. So. My point is this. If there were 30 trophies and they were all identical, I want one of those. Yeah. It is not important. I don't like it. I don't like it when they make these different trophies. They think it's cool, but in my mind, there's only 30 of those. Yeah. You know, I want to try to see how many of those I can get. Yeah. You know, and we I'll still your point. Yeah. We still do that in dirt racing. We got yeah. this thing called the Summer Nationals. And we run like, you know, 29 races in 32 days. And the trophies are all identical, except, you know, the little thing reads what race. And, uh, you know, when there's only so many of those trophies made, I want one. So at that time, they were making, you know, some identical trophies. But that trophy was given to me by the, the racetrack, the, the one that Rusty robbed from me. It, you know, the, the Volusia <laughs> Speedway made it. Yeah. And uh, so I I got it back. And uh, how did you get it back? When he wasn't looking one day and forgot, like ten years later, Liter <laughs> literally you swiped your own trophy. I just back. I just stole it. <laughs> <laughs> and he and he never noticed, you know, because because at that time he's on to his own thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we actually still got the, those two. I got I got the real one. And I got the copy. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I just, it, it just. <laughs> And I stole a trailer from him that I still have. <laughs> I told him, I said, hey, brother, I said, that, tra that trailer you got, I said, it's yours, but I'm using it. He's a good brother. Beginning at Darlington and for the next several weeks, you and Bobby Labonte are literally trading the point yeah. standings lead back and forth every right. week. Right. Was that fun or was that nerve-wracking? So that was confusing for anybody right now. I'll explain it my best. I really like Bobby Labonte. I really like him. But damn, he's good. He's good, you know. Uh, he's better than me. Uh, I've studied his style. You know, he, 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 it's kind of funny. People won't get this. But there was one other great race car driver like him, Dick Trickle. Dick, Dick drove with one foot. Bobby is like that. Bobby Labonte races with one foot on the gas, on the brake. You're, ne you're, you're, you're not on the gas and the brake. It's either one or the other. And what I liked, always liked about Bobby, and, and Bobby will tell you, we're, we're dear friends of this day. It's kind of funny because all the success Bobby has, has had, 
NASCAR champion. I mean, he's done it all. For some reason, his brain r- goes right back to when me and him started racing. And, and it, it's, it's so easy. It's, it's kind of like being a child. It's like when you're born, you remember, you remember your childhood like that. And me and Bobby remember those Bush days like that because those are the days that they defined us. What I remember about Bobby was I remember Bobby. Well, we always pitted next to each other because we was always one, two in the points. So, you mean, we were, we were big time at that time, that year. You know, of course, our heroes were Tommy Ellis, Tommy Houston, you know, Jack Ingram. Those were our heroes. But at that, that particular year, me and Bobby were one, two. And I was always watching Bobby. I was always looking at his chassis setup. Where was his, where was his, you know, his track bar, J bar? Where was his, you know, what kind of springs did he have? And, uh, you know, Big Bob, his dad, you know, they had a good crew. Bobby had a well-oiled crew. And, uh, but yeah, uh, me and Bobby were, I mean, literally going back and forth. And you're right. It was like, it was like a game of tennis. Yeah. He'd outrun me, I'd run him. He'd outrun me, I'd run him. And then the end. You know, you'll probably ask about that. Well, that's, that's my <laughs> next question. Uh, you had won at New Hampshire. You dominated at New yep. Hampshire. Yeah. But the next time around in October, yep. you got into a really bad crash. See? And see. that that is the story, right. one of the stories in Second to None that really right. stands out to me. So you see me doing this right now. So here's the deal. That moment is the epitome, and that moment destroyed my career. That was the end of Kenny Wallace. Loud, New Hampshire, 1991. Going down the back straightaway, left rear trailing arm broke a weld. Something broke. I go down into three. Now, mind you, let me remind you, all I got to do is just running the top 10 in these races, and I'm going to be the champion. Yeah. Because I had like a 200-something point lead, or more than that. And all of a sudden, I'm spinning around backwards like this, and here's the wall, and my head comes out. My head comes out, and it hits, hits kind of the C pillar of the race car. Like, So here's my head, and here's this thing here. I hit, my, I hit the window net, and I hit my head. On the B post. On the, they call it the B pillar, right? Yeah. Good job. And then, uh, if you hit to, if you'd hit the C post, you wouldn't be here. Yeah, I was. <laughs> Thank you. A post, B post, C. I only went one through twelve. You know. <laughs> if, if you hit the C post, that would have been something. Yeah, B, B post. Yeah. That'd be a stretch. That'd be hey. <laughs> That'd be a stretch. Yeah. Uh, I like good comedy. Yeah. So stretch. On my neck would have had to stretch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the corner worker tells me, get out, sit down, Kenny. And that was it. I get out, I sit down, and uh, I know I, I felt like I was at home sleeping. And I hear, I hear Kenny, Kenny. I open my eyes up, and I'm laying, I'm laying on the racetrack in turns three and four at Loud, New Hampshire. I was, I had a, what they call a positional vertigo where, I'll just make it simple. It's what Dr. Petty explained to me. There's a gyro in all our heads, and that gyro tells you when you're turning right, up, and my gyro was destroyed, and I was throwing up everywhere. I couldn't race the next week. I could not run Rockingham, and I simply lost the championship, you know, because I was I wasn't in my right mind, and... Uh, and it was, it was, now listen, I come back to win a lot more after that. I came back in, in the following years to win way more. But that moment, you know, is, is the moment that just devastated me. I, 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 to this day, I've never got over it. And, and here's why. Because I was the champion. I was going to win that championship. No, there was just nothing to it. I was going to win it. And, uh. And back in those days, you know, you, you, you kind of wanted a little w- little feather in your cap. You know what I mean? It, it, uh, now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that championship would have defined me, but it just knocked, knocked me out. I mean, literally knocked me out. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a lot of people, you know, and it could have been one of you all, 
for the next six months, they, you know, the rumor going, man, Kenny Wallace is not the same. And, and I wasn't. But what was weird was the very next year, <clears throat> I won at Martinsville when Felix bought the team. But, uh, but there, there's no, and I, and I tell you what, here, here's what a bummer it is. That was the year I should have moved my ass right back to St. Louis. Because from then on, it was just no fun for me down here. Horrible. I, I'm just going to ask the question. Was it physical or was it mental? Mental. Really? Yeah, mental. Okay. Yeah, mental because because I wanted it so bad. Uh, I wanted to do good so bad. And, you know, and there was a lot of things going on. Uh, how do I say it? You know, it was just seemed like, you know, everybody loved me. I was, you know, I had a lot of friends, but it was just, you know, it just, it just nothing. I mean, I had a lot of sponsors, but it was just, it was like everything got harder. Mm -hmm. Just everything got harder. You know what I mean? And it's in a book that I wrote. I got a book. It's about 10, 12 years old. It's called Inside Herman's World. And, uh, but everything got harder. Wow. It just did. Now, and like I said, now I went on to drive for Filbert and we won three races that year and I was big time. I went back to cup and about won a cup race, you know, down at Rockingham. And, but, but it was just the, to this moment, if, if, if somebody said, if you need therapy, what would it be for? I'd say, well, it ain't about, but one thing, and that would have been that, that moment, that time. Huh. Yeah. End of the 1991 season, yep. you drive a handful of cup races for Team 3. Right. And Sam McMahon. Right. Things look great. You, right. You've got a deal to go cup racing. And <laughs> all of a sudden, it falls apart. I forgot all about that. Well, I'm here but, to. But you, but you, but, but, but. <laughs> I'm here but to you, remind you. <laughs> but you just. See, I don't whine. I don't cry. I'm a big, yeah. bo I'm a big boy. Yeah. But when yeah. I told you things just got harder. Yeah. I forgot all about that. And that's one reason it got harder. So Rusty sells our Bush Grand National team because I'm going to drive for Sam McMahon. Yeah. I'm going cup. Yeah. You know, three years in the Bush Grand National Series, things went good, didn't get the championship, but now, and, you know, things went good. So Rusty sells the team. And I mean, all this stuff happens from, let's say the end of the year is October or November, whatever. Let's say the end of the year was November. Yeah. November, December, January, three months, my career, it literally obliterated. I'm going to drive for Sam McMahon. He goes to friggin' prison for taking his investors' money and selling on the race and taking all that money, you know, and spending it on the race team. Yeah. Okay. So, so now we're scrambling. We get Felix. Now, here's where Felix Sabatis comes to rescue. We get Felix. I, I, I forgot a little part. Sam McMahon's spending all this money. He buys the Bush Grand National team. So we get Felix to buy the team yeah. from Sam McMahon. Yeah. I mean, this is last minute stuff. We're like we're going to Daytona, and, and Felix is a good good businessman. He finally works it out, and that's how I end up driving for Felix Sabatis. At the last minute, he buys that team, and now I'm now the month before I'm running for I'm racing for Sam McMahon, and, and a month later, he's going to prison, <laughs> and we're trying to get this team ready to go back to the Bush Series. Talk about total unbelievable i mean like am i living a dream <laughs> and all up until then everything's perfect in my career it was like what just happened <laughs> so you have the injury at new hampshire then you have the mike mahan thing and you you talked about you should have moved back to missouri at that point was there ever a time when you said okay this deal with team three has gone to pot you know what? Yes. I am going to go back to Missouri, run ASA, or do whatever it is. Yes, when, when I couldn't get him to pay me and had to beg him for money. Yeah. So you got to remember now, back then I moved down here, and Rusty's paying me 25000 a year, and I can't believe it. 
Holy moly. And I'm living in a single wide mobile home up here on Tryon Street. Yeah. I'm living in a single wide mobile home on Tryon Street and we got the Cox Treated Lumber Money, Mobile One, Miller Lite. I think we had like six hundred grand for that year. And that was all the all the money you needed. And at, the, at that time, what am I going to do with $25,000? I mean, I don't even know what to do with it all because um, it's it's unbelievable. Steve, it, Steve, he's bragging because he was getting $25,000 a year. And when I started it saying you were only paying me twenty, <laughs> <laughs> But you didn't have to cheat death like I did. <laughs> But so so what happened? You know, you you get five hundred bucks a week, five fifty a week, and you're living in a single wide mobile home. All you got's electric bill and water, you know, and that's it. It was a simple time in life. So then, Rusty felt like Rusty. I remember Rusty saying this. He goes, "I let you go like a bird." It's like, okay, I got Herman ready. Now you're ready to go. And at the at the time with Sam McMahon, everything's going good, you know, and and all this stuff blew up right after the race season. We even went to Sparks Steakhouse in New York to celebrate. Yeah. That's where we announced it. Yeah. At the top of the Rockefeller Center. I know where it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, December, you were still good. Yeah, you were still good to go and then it all So then I was like, He won't he won't pay me. And, you know, it's like, you know, back then why would you save money? I don't need you know, we didn't think about saving money back then. You know, I'm twenty something years old, we're racing. And I would go to the shop and I'd say, Sam, could, could I get paid? You know, it might have been six hundred dollars. I don't know, but that's when I knew. About after the fourth time I asked him, it was like, oh, something ain't right here. Yeah. And and you know, the team was operating out of the one of the uh, old Blue Max buildings, the the southernmost building. Uh, Blue Max had this long stretch of buildings, and there was one building that was separate from blue max and and um yeah that that's what i mean it was like just nutso <laughs> i forgot all about that but that was the craziest one of the craziest like what in the world is going on <laughs> so you get hooked up with felix yep you run 92 in the bush series for felix right that was just a savior yeah. year. oh yeah 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 but then in 93 right. you do finally right. get to go cup racing right. full time right, right. At the at the cup level, Jeff Hammond yep. was your crew chief, and he had worked with Daryl Waltrip for right. a long time, and he was your crew chief. Right. How much of a learning curve did the two of you have when it came to your working relationship and in your communication? Worst year of my life, nineteen ninety three. Really. Worst year of my life. Okay. So, ninety one. That was the worst moment. That was when. Now remind remember. When I wrecked in '91, and I'm that's just this is just a timeline, right? '91 sure. was not the worst year of my life because we're winning. I just get hurt. After '91, everything goes. I didn't know none of us coming. So here's what happens with me and Felix. My uncle Gary was a large vacuum cleaner janitorial business in St. Louis. Royal owned vacuum cleaners called Dirt Devil. They called my uncle Gary and said, "Hey, we remember when I told you back then you didn't have to ask for sponsors." Yeah, yeah. So, a guy named this is how much I remember that the the the, uh, the CEO was a guy named John Balch, and his commercials were famous. He had this little Dirt Devil vacuum cleaner, and he had a dog, and he's cleaning up that. That hair. And I remember Dale Earnhardt Sr. and Harry Gant saying, Herm, get me one of them. I want one of them for my airplane. A little bitty. And they were cool. Little miniature vacuum cleaners. So they get a hold of us through my uncle and my dad. My dad runs, you know, the domestic side of the business. It was domestic, household vacuum cleaners, and commercial side, you know, for street cleaners, things like that. So... Now, I just want to back up. There was no money there. I never got any money. The business was good, but it just paid everybody. There was no excess money. So my Uncle Gary calls and goes, hey, got this company. Turn them over to Felix. I bring the sponsor to Felix, Dirt Devil. You know, and, and we ran it in 92, Bush Series, and they went cup with us. Okay? And so much to right before that Team 3 deal ended, 
there were some postcards where the Dirt Devil number 24 car, I I still probably got some hit, or I might have thrown them away to forget it. But that Dirt Devil sponsor came in right after 91, like December. We announced the sponsor, everything. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, we were able to take that Dirt Devil when when uh, Team 3 got in trouble and he went to prison. We were able to take it over to Felix, had a sponsor, ran 92. Now we got it for 93, and we go cup racing. Now, 1993, let's, 93, my competition, guess who all decides to be cup drivers in 1993? Jeff Gordon. <laughs> Bobby Lavani. Right. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> Bad timing. <laughs> so I get my ass whipped, handed to me. But when you look back on it, I mean, who didn't Jeff Gordon whip up on? That's right. Uh, but, you know, later that year, I noticed Bobby started getting really good with Bill Davis and that Maxwell house car. Yeah. So 93, I had Jeff Hammond as my crew chief. And we started button heads, and because it was getting frustrating, I wasn't running any good, and uh, you know we hated each other. We love each other now, because we, me and me and Jeff Hammond have forgiven each other. We d- we've done a lot of TV together. We've hugged it out, uh, so we're all good now. Twenty twenty five years later, but ninety three. You know I got I. I you know, that was it. I was out of the Cup Series because it didn't go good. You know, Felix fired me. Fired me because dirt, he sat me down, and he goes, Kenny Wallace, in that Cuban accent, we would keep the team going, but then Dirt Devil went belly up, and here's why. He spent all of his, there, there was no earnings. So at the, they thought, they were selling all these vacuum cleaners, but but Dirt Devil, which under the stock market was Royal, R-O-Y-A-L. They didn't make any money because he spent, John Balch and Dirt Devil spent all their money on those commercials. They just went commercial happy. Yeah, yeah. So they made no money. So John Balch calls Felix up, says, Felix, we got to pull a sponsor. Felix calls me up and uh, he fires me. Because Jeff Hammond convinces him that I can't drive. And maybe I couldn't drive. Uh, but then, because the stars aligned, Jeff told Felix I couldn't drive. Dirt Devil left. So, uh, you know, I will brag on Felix a little bit. I think he gave me, he paid me off, gave me a little bit of money. You know, we're not talking big money, but whatever. You know, he gave me a little bit of money. Could have been a Could have been $75,000. Because we had a contract, uh, me and me and Felix were in such an argument that Dale Earnhardt Sr. at Wilkesboro grabbed us both by the heads and said, "Look, <laughs> the garage area does not like this. You two need to get along." That is on my hand on a Bible. Uh, so I'm nice until I get pissed, you know. Then I go, as they would say, I go postal, you know, and. Uh, I was hurt, crushed, because I knew once you get kicked out of the Cup Series, there ain't no coming back. Of course, I did, but, yeah, I just all it, keep asking, because it's all going to keep going like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, 94 was good. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Ask about Phil Martossi. How'd you get hooked up to Phil? Philbert Martossi. Yes. What? My savior, my <laughs> Lord and savior, Philbert Martossi, uh, an Italian man out of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so Jeff Burton had drove for them, and I could they didn't win a lot, but they had a lot of speed. And I knew I, that car looked good all the time. So I brushed myself off after the ninety three fiasco sometime during the winter. And I called them up. I literally called them up. I don't know if somebody, I swear, I swear I don't know why. I can't remember, but I called them up and I said, hey, I'd like to come talk to you about driving your car. Rusty was going to Nashville for something. I get a ride on his airplane. 
Philbert is there to pick me up, which I didn't even know Philbert. I saw him in the garage area. Rusty goes, does his deal. I thought it was funny because Philbert said to me, because I, I, I did, he says, I kind of thought you were too good of a driver. This is what he said. I'll never forget it. He goes, I kind of thought you were too good of a driver to want to drive my car. I thought you were coming here to talk about Mike. And I went, wow. He goes, I can't believe you want to drive my car. Absolutely. And, you know, and put his hand across. And <laughs> we didn't sign no contracts, nothing. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so, and, and, and I mean, as soon as I got in that car, we just hauled ass. Yeah. And probably had the, you know, we, we I think we got, I think we had some motor issues, but still we won three races and won a lot of awards for being fast. And uh, at, at that time, my head, you know, I'm all good. I was good in 93 too, you know, uh, 90, you know, I, I had that wreck in 91, but you know, I, I recovered right away. We started winning, but uh, you know, ninety four was a ninety four was a great year. That was my re- redemption year. That was a year that I I reminded myself that you know, hey, I'm good. I'm a winner, and I and I. But we ran good, really good. Ernie gets hurt at Michigan in August, right? Nineteen ninety four. You get the ride, right? Fam, how did that come about? So. When Ernie Irvin got hurt at Michigan in 1994, yeah. tragic accident, just, oh, yeah. just knocked him out forever. Ford and Jack Roush really liked me. Actually, Jack Roush cornered me one day and said, hey, if anything ever happens with you and Felix, I want you to come drive for me. Now, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable. I could never tell anybody that. Now I can. But... Ford liked me. So they literally wanted me to take over for Ernie. And it was it was wonderful. Now, I wasn't ready for that car at that moment because I had, you know, I just I just wasn't ready. It was such a shock. However, I, I was okay. I mean, I didn't do great in the car, but I didn't do bad either. Mm-hmm. It's not like I mean, I remember running tenth at you know, like like that car led all the laps and was leading all the races. I jumped in it and I ran it in the top ten. You know, yeah. but still, it, the, that car was automatically fast, Steve. You just get in it, and you'd qualify, and you think, I'm thinking, oh, that wasn't a really good lap. And you come in, the team's going, yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, you, you're, you know, you qualified six for the Southern 500. I'm like, really? <laughs> that car just went fast on its own. Yeah. You were in Martinsville. You get a fourth-place finish, I think, and mm-hmm. Rusty wins the race. Right. What was that like for you? Well, I remember that day because um, Rusty ran behind me forever. I kept looking up in the mirror and I kept waiting for Rusty to get me on the inside. Now I'm in the I'm in the 28 Texaco Hamlin car, right? And I kind of forget it, you know. I, I'm just once you get in the car, you forget what it says. You're just going, you know. And um, I kept waiting for Rusty. To, you know, finally through pit stops, he gets ahead of me. You know what I remember about that race hmm. was accidentally spin, spinning Dale Earnhardt Sr. out. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Come on, man. Tell, tell us the real story. You meant to take it out. <laughs> I'll I tell you what happened. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, this, look, it, here, here's, here's a Bible. My hand's on the Bible. We come off a of turn two. I look in my mirror, and Earnhardt, uh, he really doesn't have position on me, but he does that thing we did years ago where we, we'd get out of each other's mirror. Back, back then, we didn't have a spotter mirror. See, all we had was this mirror. Later, we all started running these mirrors down here. Yeah, yeah. If you ran those, that meant you were a bobo, and nobody ran them. So I looked at my mirror, and it's Earnhardt. And he, 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 he does the And so I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to let him go, you know, because – I'm running really good. I'm running in the top five. So, you know, I'm big time. Um, I'm one of the guys up front. Well, he entered the corner at a bad angle. And I entered the corner on this really good angle. So he slows it down to, and right in the middle. I, I just gas up. I'm ready to go. Bam. I mean, I lift him clear in the ass, spin him right out. And, oh, my God. He he smoke. He just stays in the gas. And I look, and I'm like, oh, my God, caution's flying. <laughs> I just stopped the whole cup race. You know? <laughs> and, 
and he's it, running for the championship. Yeah, burnt, burnt, <laughs> in, burnt, burnt into my brain is I spin him out in the middle of turns three and four at Martinsville. I spin Dale Earnhardt Sr. out <laughs> in the middle of turns three and four, standing room only, national TV. We get down to turns one and two, and he did a 360 so fast. And now at this time, me, him, and Rusty, we're tight. You know, we're friends. And at that time, we, we figured out how you could race each other, still rough each other up, and still be friends. You could do that somehow. We figured it out. And at that time, hmm. we get down to the next corner, and I'm like, oh, no. I look at my mirror. Here he comes. <laughs> he, and he, he, he sit low in that car. Earnhardt sit real low in that car. And like, it, it, you could, I could barely see his face. <laughs> and I see that bear, that bubble goggles, and he went. <laughs> and that's all he did <laughs> and we never talked about it <laughs> did you not <laughs> never it was just he knew i didn't mean to spit him out but it was just one of those deals you know that was that was that was a great yeah. great time yeah we, we, we ran good so hey i gotta tell you something about that in my race shop right now uh at the end of that year uh robert yates they had a christmas party they gave me the right front brake rotor and the right front brake pad and a rear brake pad because I was really good on brakes. I wasn't hard on brakes. And to this day, everybody on the team signed that brake rotor, and it's in my race shop right now as a doorstop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I got that. 